All right, let's get right into the Torah portion. Uh, the Torah portion is called Vayigosh. Now, what does Vayigosh mean? And he came near. <clears throat> this is Yosef coming near to his uh, brethren, and uh, they came near to him, and what a shock this was. They didn't realize that who was standing before them was Joseph. Can you imagine how scary that would be? You know, is he going to kill us? But let's look at Genesis 44, 18. It says, then Judah, what did he do? He came near. And that's what that says in Hebrews too. We're supposed to come near to the Messiah. But the problem is sometimes we don't want to come too close because of sins. And it's like, oops, <laughs> will he forgive me? Is he mad at me? Well, here Judah came near to him. And <clears throat> this is what Judah says to Joseph. Oh, my Lord, let your servant, I pray you, speak a word in my Lord's ears. And let not your anger burn against your servant, for you are even as Pharaoh. How old is Judah when this happens? Judah is 44. Judah is 44 years old. Now, look at Genesis 44, 19 to 23. My Lord asked his servant, saying, Have you a father or a brother? <clears throat> And we said to my Lord, we have a father, an old man and a child of his old age, a little one, a little one, a little bitty. And his brother is dead and he alone is left of his mother and his father loves him. And you said to your servants, bring him down to me that I may set my eyes on him. And we said to my Lord, the little boy can't leave his daddy. For if he should leave his father, his father would Die, and you said to your servants, unless your youngest brother come down with you, you will see my face no more. Okay, they're calling Benjamin a child, a little one. How old is Benjamin at this time? Benjamin is 30 years old with 10 kids himself. Okay. Now, Genesis 46, 21. Look at this. Coming into Egypt, it lists all of the sons. And it says, the sons of Benjamin were Bela, Becker, Ashbel, Gera, Damon, Ehi, Rosh, Muppin, and Huppam, and Art. So look at all these kids. He's got 10 kids. And yet he's called a little one, a child. Well, let's go back uh, and uh, look at Genesis 44, 30. But first, let me show you this timeline. Okay, so right here, <laughs> Leah's kids, this is in the order of their birth. So when they entered Egypt, this is how old everybody was. Ephraim and Manasseh were eight and nine. Benjamin's 30, Joseph's 39, Dina's 39. But that kind of gives you the age and who the parents were in the order of their birth. And so you can see the age of when they finally entered Egypt. Now, there's something amazing about that. I'm going to show you here in a little bit. But here also is a, the timeline in another direction here in the year 2234 AM, which means 2234 from Adam, going just one direction, Jacob is 126. Here, Benjamin is 30 years old. He's, got, he's been married, uh, what, 13 years? He has 10 kids. And then here is when they enter Egypt, the whole family. Uh, and then the years go by. Jacob is 133. The famine ends, and now they have just life in Egypt uh, and what goes on. Okay, now, in Genesis 44, 30, Judah says, Now, therefore, when I came to your servant, my father, and the lad is not with us, seeing that his life is bound up in the lad's life. Oh, my goodness, Rachel's, Rachel dies. Now they think Joseph is dead. Uh, and now Benjamin is the only one, and, and they're totally afraid to death that he's going to, you know, keep Benjamin, and they won't take them back, and then their dad's in big trouble. But you have to remember, how many years have gone by? From Joseph was 17, and now what happens, he ends up getting raised up, and then two more years go by because of the famine. Uh, so Joseph is around 40 years old, okay? And because he's four years younger than Judah. So Judah's 44. He's going to be like 40. 
And then he says this, he says, now remember what happened during those missing 22 years? We don't really know what happened to all of the other brothers. It's 22 years of unrecorded history. And if you remember, I said that was because the, the brothers were just stuck because of the trauma that they caused their dad. They didn't know what to do, where to go, that nothing happened. The only thing we read about is Judah really goes off the rails and he marries the Canaanite and his wife dies, two of his sons die. So now at this point, Judah knows what it's like to lose a child. He never realized it. When he's, he was young and he sold Joseph, you know, my goodness, now after 22 years, he suffered, his wife is dead, two of his sons are dead. He can relate to dad now, really. That's why uh, Jacob didn't want uh, Reuben to be the one to take uh, Benjamin, because Reuben said, well, if he dies, you can kill my two kids. How stupid, as if grandpa wants to kill the other two kids. Uh, but Judah says, I will be responsible. And so what do we see here? In Genesis 44, 32 and 33, he says, for your servant became surety for the lad to my father, saying, if I bring him not to you, I will bear the blame to my father forever. Now, therefore, I pray you, let your servant abide instead of the lad, a slave to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brothers. What do we see here? Judah alone is taking total responsibility. Judah is now coming to Benjamin's aid. We see his heart has totally repented and he's changed. Now, look at Genesis 37, 23. It says, it came to pass when Joseph was come to his brethren, what did they do? They stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him. Well, what does that coat represent that he had on? What was so special about it? It re- represented the fact that he was the heir to the estate, okay, or to the throne. With Joseph gone, Benjamin would have been next in line. Judah is now willing to lay down his life for Benjamin. Well, you know what's fascinating? Do you know what happens a couple hundred years later? Look at 1 Samuel 18, 1 and 2. It came to pass when he made an end of speaking to Saul that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. Here's someone from the tribe of Benjamin who knits his heart with someone from the tribe of Judah, and it was David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul, and so Saul took him that day and would let him go no more home to his father's house. So what do we see here? Saul adopts David. So David, because Saul is king, David could be the next heir to the throne. Well, if you're Jonathan, you might be jealous of David because you're the natural son and you think you should be king. You following me? So Jonathan is from the tribe of Benjamin and David is from the tribe of Judah. So here's a reversal. A son of Benjamin has his soul knit with a son of Judah. And look what happens in 1 Samuel 18, verse three and four. Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul and Jonathan stripped off his garment. Just like Joseph had his garment stripped off by Judah. Here we have some Benjamin stripping off his robe that was on him and gave it to David. So in other words, he's saying, I don't care if you are the next heir to the throne. Well, what's interesting, do you know which tribe the temple mount is? The temple itself was built on in which tribe? It is directly on the border of Judah and Benjamin. And they say the Holy of Holies was actually in Benjamin's territory. Just like you would have a fence, a border. Isn't that incredible? Uh, The Talmud explains that all the most important parts, even the Shekinah, were entirely in Benjamin's section. What's amazing is uh, Rabbi Shaul, or Apostle Paul, was from the tribe of Benjamin. So, I mean, it's incredible when you can get these two kids from two different tribes and there's always warring and fighting coming together. Now, look at Romans 9, 3 and 4. What does the Apostle Paul, who's from the tribe of Benjamin, say? Just like back in the Genesis story, he says, I wish that I myself were a curse from Messiah for my brother's sake, my relatives according to the flesh, who are Israelites, who to whom belongs the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service, and the promises. 
These are all phenomenal. And here we see someone from the tribe of Benjamin willing to lay down his life. Just like Moses from the tribe of Levi is willing to lay down his life. And Judah from, you know, uh, he wants to lay down his life. Uh, but this is really what being a part of the family of God is all about. In modern Christianity, it's almost like, hey, as long as I'm saved, I don't care about you. I got it. I'm, you know, hey, I'm good. I'm, you know, if, I, if you can, I don't care. But you have to realize, what about the father? You're saying it, that his other son or daughter doesn't matter. And so the, much of, many people are so narcissistic. All they think about is themselves. As, as long as they get it in, and they even think they can do whatever they want. They got Jesus in their pocket, and they'll just pull them out when they need them. Uh, and they, they're not even caring about, when I think of evangelizing, it's not evangelizing. It's like when uh, the newspaper talks about some kids lost on a mountain and you're going to go try to find it because you know the parent and you're concerned about the parent. The reason why I want to evangelize is because I love dad and his heart's broken over those kids that are wandering. You know, it's a, it's a different mindset. But look what happens in Genesis 45 verse 1 and 2. Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him. Who was all them? That's all the Egyptians. Here, here, you know, Joseph is kind of embarrassed. He's supposed to be next to the king. And here he starts crying. And he wants all the Egyptians to get the heck out of there. And what does he say? He cried out, every man, get out of here. And then it says, and there stood no man with him. Do you catch that? While he made himself known to his brothers and he wept out loud and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard. Okay, he's in a room, a small room. He's with his brothers, but everyone outside of the house heard what was going on. And the, it's important that they heard. And I think one of the reasons why is, first off, on the inside, none of his brothers knew he was Joseph. Okay, they all thought he was an Egyptian. Why did they think he was Egyptian? Looked Egyptian, spoke Egyptian, okay? And why don't the Jews recognize Yeshua today? We're presenting an Egyptian Jesus, far from his roots. I mean, he's a blonde-haired, blue-eyed, doesn't keep unleavened bread. In all the paintings of Jesus at the Last Supper, there's big loaves of bread and tuna or something on the table, nothing to do, you know, with unleavened bread. Uh, but here's the other thing. It was not only a shock to his brothers, it was a shock to the Egyptians. The Egyptians didn't know he was Jewish. And guess what? Many Christians don't know he's Jewish. I'll never forget. This was about 15 years ago. Uh, there's a sweet little old lady, about 70 years old, uh, that we knew. And she lived in Germany when the Allies were bombing Germany in World War II. Okay, so she was there. And about 10 or 15 years ago, we're just talking to her, and she could not believe that Jesus was Jewish. She had no idea. This, that, and it's like, oh my gosh. You know, right here in Washington State, I don't know, about 15 years ago, I talked to someone, they never even heard of Noah. I mean, talk about uneducated concerning the Bible. And so what's interesting also is that the Gentiles weren't the ones to open Judah's eyes to Joseph's true identity. The Gentiles didn't even realize themselves of Joseph's Jewish identity. Joseph is the one who revealed his identity to his brothers in his own time. And I believe Messiah is the one who's going to open their eyes in his own time. Well, when it's, I don't have all the verses to support this. You just have to trust me or look it up yourselves. But when it says, Joseph, there stood no man with him, that is exactly what happens on Yom Kippur. On Yom Kippur, no one can go with the high priest into the temple. That's what it says. And in Revelation, it talks about the Ark of the Covenant. Everyone sees it. And it talks about no one is standing there with him. If you remember, <clears throat> Joseph was raised out of the pit on Rosh Hashanah. 10 days later, I mean, it's a couple years later, but 10 days later from Rosh Hashanah, when the two years later, when they come, it says it's at the end of two full years of the famine. All right, so what happens, this event where he reveals himself to his brothers happens on Yom Kippur. This is a Yom Kippur event. 
And so <clears throat> what happens, Joseph says in Genesis 45, 3, I'm Joseph. Does my father yet live? And his brothers were dumbfounded. They were troubled at his presence. Their knees were knocking. They didn't know what to do. Here, right in front of them, the very Joseph they persecuted, assaulted, betrayed, wanted sold. Oh my gosh. Well, you know what's amazing? How many of you have ever heard of Chofetz Chaim? Chofetz Chaim uh, is a, a world famous rabbi that uh, spoke about Lashon Hara, guarding the tongue. Be careful how you speak. Well, listen to what he said. <clears throat> now, this Chofetz Chaim does not believe Yeshua is God, okay? But that's fine. Listen to the wisdom he has. He said, and I want you to think of this. When he says this, this is what every Jew is thinking. That's what I want you to realize. This is what is in the Jewish mind. He said that when Joseph said, I am Joseph, God's master plan became clear to his brothers. They had no more questions. Everything that happened over the last 22 years fell into perspective. So too will it be in the time to come when God will reveal himself and announce, I am Hashem. The veil will be lifted from our eyes and we will comprehend everything that has transpired throughout history. And that's what's going to happen. Yeshua is going to reveal himself on Yom Kippur and say, I am Hashem. And all of a sudden, the veil's going to, God is the one who put the veil over him. He's the one that's going to take it off. And this is going to be some event. Well, in Genesis 45, 4 and 5, <clears throat> Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me. You know what's amazing? When did Joseph reveal himself? When Judah repented. When will Messiah reveal himself? When Judah repents. That's, it's the pattern. Okay. Now, he says, I pray you. And they came near and he said again, I'm Joseph, your brother. And when you sold it, me into Egypt, don't be grieved. Don't be angry with yourselves that you sold me here because God sent me here before you to preserve life. Now, Joseph, oh my gosh, what a, I mean, he, he was so prideful. That's what got him in so much trouble, you know, but now he's really so humble and he has the bigger picture. So many of us, we go through a problem and we get all self-absorbed and angry and mad, not realizing there's a bigger picture. So when you're going through trials and tribulations, like Joseph, when he's going through them, try to find out what the bigger picture is that God's trying to do. <clears throat> and do you know, this is the very first recorded moment in history where one human forgives another. This is the very first recorded act of forgiveness. Um, but you know what? And this happens with us too. They're very unsure of his forgiveness. <laughs> Are you really forgiving? Did Joseph really mean it? Uh, you know, could someone really forgive those who wanted to kill them and wanted them sold into slavery? How easy would it be to forgive someone who wanted? You know, this also was the first act of human trafficking right here. Well, listen to James. Let me see what time it is. Okay, listen to James 4, 8 through 11. Draw near to God and what happens? He'll always meet you halfway. Just like the parable of the son who took off and his father waited. He didn't go after him. He waited until he saw him coming. And then he went out to meet him. Then it says, cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be afflicted, mourn, weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, the joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. And what happens? He lifts you up. Don't speak evil one of another, brothers. Whoever speaks evil of his brother and judges his brother, he speaks evil of the Torah, he judges the Torah, and if you judge the Torah, you're not a doer, but a judge. <clears throat> and I think what, here's one of the big problems. Too often when we think of the Torah, we think of it as just a set of laws. It's a list of legal and moral dogmas. But do you know, even before a single law of the Torah is written down, from Exodus through Deuteronomy, we find there are principles of repentance and grace and forgiveness that was established first in the book of Genesis. And you know, God was called in Genesis a shepherd before he was called their king, okay? Too often when we think of a king, we think of some despot, 
you know, but God wanted us to know that he is our loving shepherd before he is our king. Now, <clears throat> and when it says draw near, you know, on Yom Kippur, it's the one day that they draw near. And again, this is uh, scriptural proof that this happens. Uh, Israel is the one nation on Yom Kippur uh, that draws near. And then in Genesis 45, 7, he said, God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in the earth and to save you by a great deliverance. I want you to know something. It's always about the remnant. It's always about the remnant. Look at Isaiah 10, 20 through 22. <clears throat> It'll come to pass in that day that it is the remnant of Israel and such as are escaped of the house of Jacob, shall no more again <clears throat> stay on him that smote them, but shall stay on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. In truth, the remnant <clears throat> is the one who's going to return, even the remnant of Jacob to the mighty God. For though your people Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will return. That's what they say happened in Egypt. Do you know that <clears throat> they say, I think, it, uh, I can't remember the exact percentage, but I think they said 60% of Israel stayed in Egypt. Only about 40% left. And just like in Babylon, the vast majority stayed in Babylon. They enjoyed the exile. <clears throat> they didn't return. It's always a remnant. And while I'm saying that, I don't believe the whole body of Messiah is going to be the bride. Only a remnant will be the bride. Just like Adam. The whole body of Adam didn't become Eve. A remnant of Adam became Eve. Now, that doesn't mean the others aren't saved. It's just a matter of some will be the bride, some will be attending the wedding, okay? So there's, you have to look at it from another perspective. Um, look at Jeremiah 50, 20. In those days and in that time, says the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for, and there's not gonna be any. And the sins of Judah, there's not gonna be any. For I will pardon them whom I leave as a remnant, okay? And again, forgiveness happens on Yom Kippur. So let's go to Genesis 45, 9. It says, hurry and go to my father and tell him. This is what your son Joseph says. God is baby Lord of all of Egypt. Come down to me and don't wait. In other words, just like last week, it's hurry, hurry, hurry. <clears throat> and so Genesis 45, 13. Tell my father of all my glory in Egypt and of all that you have seen, you shall hurry and bring my father down here. But then what I think is interesting, in Genesis 45, 22, he tells Oh, he gives to every one of them a change of raiment. And do you remember at Mount Sinai, what did God tell them to do? Wash yourselves and put on a change of raiment. And look what happens in Revelation 19, 8. To the bride was granted that she would be arrayed in fine linen and clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. The bride's going to get a new garment. You following me? This is how it works. Let me see where I'm at. Oh, okay, got to hurry. Look at Genesis 46, 2 through 4. God said to Israel in a night vision, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here I am. And he said, I'm God, the God of your father. And he's telling him to go down to Egypt without fear. I will make a great nation out of you there. And then look what God says, but I'm going to go down with you. Okay, I'm going to go down with you to Egypt, and I will see that you come back again. And at your death, Joseph will put his hands on your eyes. That is amazing. So what happens? They all pack their bags, and they're all headed into Egypt. Now, here comes something that is mind-blowing. Are you ready? If you go to Genesis 46, 8 through 15, it's going to tell us all of the children who are going down to Egypt. Uh, Actually, uh, we're just going to work with Leah's. I'm going to show you. Well, let me just go here now. You're going to find, if you remember at the last verse of this section, there were 70 kids that went into Egypt. Everyone remember that? The 70? Well, Bilhah has seven. Rachel has 14. Zilpah has 16. Leah has 33 in that total 70. But there's a big problem. Oh, and the word is Shavim in Hebrew, which means 70. But there's only 32 people named. I counted. There is a name missing. Now, here are the exact names of Reuben and his kids, Simeon and his kids, Levi and his, Judah, Ur died, Onan died, Leah herself is dead, 
uh, and then Issachar's kids, Zebulon kids. <clears throat> you know, there were 31 boys and one girl? That poor thing. 31 boys, uh, one girl. But watch, watch this. Here, Genesis 46, 8 through 15. These are the names of the children of Israel which came into Egypt, Jacob and his sons, Reuben. Okay, there's number one, Reuben, who was Jacob's firstborn. And now it's going to tell us the sons of Reuben. And so there you see on the screen are those same names. All right, so that's Reuben's and the sons of Simeon and then the sons of, who, uh, the sons of a canaanite woman. Isn't that interesting? Simeon married a Canaanite. So much, and it mentions Canaanite. Well, that kind of, what is, uh, none of his kids were Jews then? Hmm. Okay. Uh, and then it mentions, uh, well, it has Judah. And I crossed out Ur and Onan because they're dead. So they don't count. Uh, and then it says, and the sons of Peretz were Hezron and Hamul and the sons of Issachar. So this is mentioning just uh, Leah's family. There's a total of 33 there. Okay. Now, let me see. Okay, here's something I'm going to show you. This is so mind-blowing. Let me see. Okay. Joseph was sold at seven. Oh, wait. I don't want to show you that one yet. You're going to. Don't look. Don't look. I'm going to go back. And in Genesis uh, 46, 8 through 15, where it mentions these. This is what's crazy. Ow. Let me see. I don't. Let me. I'm going to forget the PowerPoint slide for just a second. I'm going to go here, and I want to read what this says. Let me go to the beginning. We can actually put the PowerPoint up. I think everybody can read my Bible here. That's fine. If you can, if you can put my screen up, let me open this. This is what is uh, just totally amazing. Okay. Oh, I gotta go, man. I gotta go to Genesis 46. Let me go here. Okay, here's where it's mentioning them. Now look at this in verse six. Up at the top, it says, they took their cattle, their goods, which they had gotten in the land of Canaan. They came to Egypt, Jacob and all his seed with him. His sons, <clears throat> his sons' sons with him, his daughters, plural. There's only one daughter mentioned in all of this. There's a daughter missing and a daughter from Leah's area because all the other numbers add completely up. So how can that be? And then you go to the very end when they add uh, everything up here. It says, uh, let me look at this other verse too. Okay, here it says, and uh, all the souls which came into Egypt were three score and 10 or 70. Why is there one missing? Because it was a daughter who was under eight days old until she hadn't been named yet. So this is why the count is off as counting 69 people were missing one, but several times it says daughters, plural. So we know it was a daughter. We know it was from Leah because the count is missing from Leah's side. So one of her kids had a daughter who wasn't eight days old yet, so she hadn't been named. So that solves that problem. Now going back to this, here's something else that's going to be shocking. Okay. Um, <clears throat> in Genesis 46, 27, and 28. No, I don't want to go there yet. I'm going to show you something else. Okay. Joseph was sold at 17, right? 22 years go by. And so Joseph is 39. They all come into Egypt and Judah enters at 44 years old. So all this unfolds and Judah's 44 and Joseph's only 39. Well, guess what? Judah is 23 when 
uh, Tamar, or not Tamar, this Canaanite woman gives birth to Ur and Onan. What happens? Ur dies. Onan dies, right? Let me look at my notes here a second. Okay. Then what happens? Tamar has to wait a year for Sheila, right? So he's 24. The, or this is when Judah gives birth, uh, not gives birth, but fathers, uh, Sheila. And then Judah is 33. Ur is 10 years old when he marries. He marries Tamar. I'm not sure how old Tamar is, but Ur is only 10 years old when he marries Tamar. And then Judah is 33 because Ur dies. Onan, who is now 10, marries Tamar. Sheila's only nine, so he has to wait a year until he's 10 years old to marry Tamar. And then Judah's 34 when Shelah becomes 10, but he doesn't give her to Tamar. So she fools Jacob. And this is when Peretz is born. Well, guess what? How does this happen? And the reason this has to happen is because it says in the list of all the people who's coming, Judah's 44 and Peretz has twins. How can... So this is why it has to be that way. There's only 22 years missing. So Ur has to get to 10 years old to have, you know, and then to be killed to get married. But then Judah and Tamar get together and now they have to wait another 10 years for Peretz to get married. And 10 and 10 is 20. And when you look at the text, when they go into Egypt, Peretz already has two kids. So they had to get married at 10 in order for Perez to take two kids in there. Now that's, I don't know if you ever looked at that, but that's the difference between reading your Bible and studying your Bible. Uh, you go and you, you, all of a sudden you find a missing daughter and then all of a sudden you find out, oh my goodness, if I look at this, this is how it had to happen. Isn't that crazy? But yeah, go back and look at the text. It's amazing. Okay, so we're almost done here. Genesis 46, 27, and 28. The sons of Joseph, whom he had in Egypt, were two. Seventy persons of the family of Jacob came into Egypt. Now he had sent Judah before him to Goshen to get a word from Joseph. So they came to the land of Goshen. I think I have the Hebrew on your notes. You don't see this in English. You only see it in Hebrew. It's a misspelling on purpose. Here, the first time Goshen is the Gimel Shin Nun, but the second time it has the letter Hey on the end. Goshen Na is only found twice, and they're both in adjacent verses in 28 and now in 29. Joseph got his carriage ready and went to Goshen Na for the meeting with his father. When he came before him, he put his arms around his neck, weeping. Well, why Goshen? And why Goshen Na and why in the world did the English translate it wrong? Well, here's the thing. I don't know if you knew this, but Goshen was a place of miracles, right? Well, guess what? At Hanukkah, there's a connection. Goshen Na are the exact letters that are on every single dreidel that you spin. And Gadol, the Gimel, is big. The Ness is a miracle. Uh, then the Hayah happened, Sham, there. And every year in Israel, they say, you know, or ever in the diaspora, we say a big miracle happened there. In Israel, it's a great miracle happened here. But all the Jews in the diaspora, look at that. And what happened? It was in Goshen that none of the plagues affected them. All right? And he's going to a place of miracles. That's what this Bible is telling us. But here's the other thing. Guess what else? When you add up the numerical value of Goshenah, it's 358, which is the same numerical value of the Mashiach. I think that's fascinating. So here we have Goshen and we have Goshen Ah. But again, you don't get to see that in English. Uh, let's see. Genesis 46, 33 and 34. It says, now when Pharaoh sends you, sends for you, and he says, what is your business? 
Say your servants have been keepers of cattle from our early days up to now like our fathers, and this way you'll be able to have the land of Goshen for yourselves because keepers of sheep are unclean in the eyes of the Egyptians. And then in Genesis 47, 5, Pharaoh tells Joseph, let them have the land of Goshen. And if there are any able men among them, put them over my cattle. Well, uh, you know what's amazing about this? I remember reading the other day uh, well, I'll show you here in a minute. Okay, Genesis 47, 7 through 10. Joseph makes his father Jacob come before Pharaoh, and Jacob blessed Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to him, how old are you? And Jacob said, the years of my wanderings have been 130, small in number, full of sorrow, have been the years of my life, and less than the years of the wanderings of my fathers. And so Jacob gave Pharaoh his blessing. Now look at verse 11 through 21. We only got one more verse after Joseph made a place for his father and his brothers and gave them a heritage in the land of Egypt. And look what they got. The best land, the land of Ramesses, as Pharaoh had given orders. And Joseph took care of his father and his brothers and all his father's people, giving them food for the needs of their families. Now, look. Now, now if you remember, they came at the second year of famine, right? Two years of famine had gone by. Things have been going on in Egypt, and you're about to see what happened. It says, <clears throat> uh, now there was no food to be had in the land, so that all of Egypt and Canaan were wasted from need of food. And all the money in Egypt and in the land of Canaan, which had been given for grain, came into the hands of Joseph. And he put it in Pharaoh's house. So what did the first, I think if this going on today, this is, this is where our economy is headed. I'm just telling you prophetically, this is where our economy is headed. All the money was given into the government's hands. You following me? Then what happens? When all the money in Egypt and Canaan was gone, that happened in the first year. The Egyptians came to Joseph and said, give us food. Would you have us to come to destruction before your eyes? We have no money. So listen to what the government says. Give me your cattle and I will give you grain in exchange for your cattle if your money is all gone. So they took the cattle to Joseph and gave them bread in exchange for their horses, flocks, herds, and asses so that all that year he gave them food in exchange for the cattle. And when that year ended, which is the second year, they came to him in the second year and they said, we may not keep it from our Lord's knowledge that all our money is gone. Now all of the herds of our cattle are my Lord's. There's nothing more to give my Lord but our bodies and our land. Are we to come to destruction before your eyes? And we and our land? So what did he do? They said, take us and our land for food. We and our land will be servants to Pharaoh and give us seed that we may have life and the land may not become waste. So they sold all the land to the government. This is why Pharaoh could legally give Goshen to the Israelites. He had to wait until he got all the land. First, they take all the money. Then they take everything you own because you want to live, you want to eat. Okay. And then they took the land well, that's why he could give Goshen. It's the, that happened, this is happening in the third year when they come. And then, it, uh, so Joseph got all the land in Egypt for Pharaoh, for every Egyptian gave up his land in exchange for food because of their great need. So all the land became Pharaoh's. And as for the people, they all became slaves to the government. Do you see the pattern? First, they're going to take the money. They may make it digital money. And then they're going to control it or end up taking it all. And they're going to take everything you own. And then they're going to take your land, your houses, just so you will be their slaves. In Genesis 47, 27, it says, Israel dwelled in the land of Egypt in the country of Goshen. They had possessions and grew and multiplied exceedingly. So here we have a miraculous multiplication of children. They were coming from everywhere. So Goshen was a place of miracles, and the plagues didn't happen in Goshen. All right, with that, let's stand. We'll take a, like a 15-minute break. Uh, there's a lot of snacks and coffee and stuff like that downstairs. Good can go this way and downstairs or that way.
Uh, it's by the elevator, and we'd love to have all of our visitors uh, go down and enjoy that as well. Uh, let's pray. Avinu, Malkinu, our Father, our King, we just thank you so much for opening our eyes. Your word is not old. It's new. It's always brand new. If we would just open our eyes and look at it from the current perspective, your word is so alive. God, I just pray right now that you would make it come to life in everyone's hearts and souls. Let it reverberate uh, strongly so that they, they realize your word is a living word. May it come to life in everyone's heart. Father, we just thank you so much for all of the uh, tithes and offerings that come in from uh, here as well as the United States around the world because everyone's heart is not in their substance. All of it's going to be taken eventually, but we want to make a difference by having it sowed into your kingdom. We just thank you so much for all who give. In Yeshua's name, amen. Together, blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua. You alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Take a break. Okay. Are you ready? Buckle your seatbelts. Okay. The title of what we're looking at uh, for the next while is going deeper into the gospels. Not only do I like to cover the Torah or the Tanakh, I like covering the New Testament to bring new light into things that people don't know because they don't know the Hebraic roots. So we're going to start with Luke 1, 2 through 4. And it says, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses. So Luke is hearing from eyewitnesses, people who are ministers of the word, he says, it seems good to me also having had a perfect understanding. Wow, that's pretty good. A perfect understanding of everything from the very beginning. I want to write to you in order, most excellent Theophilus, that you might know the certainty of those things that you have been instructed. Wow, it's kind of, gr I mean, I can't help but think Abraham has to be astounded to be talking to Noah for a couple hundred years. I mean, that is just amazing. But then here, Luke He's talking to all of the apostles and everything. And so look what happens in verse, verse five through six. He says, there was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest, not just any old priest, a certain priest named Zacharias, of which course? The course of Abijah. His wife was the daughter of Aaron. Her name was Elizabeth. What's interesting is Aaron's wife back in the Exodus her name was Elisheva, same name. But it says they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and the ordinances of the Lord, blameless. Now look at verse eight and nine. It came to pass that while he did what? He executed the priest's office before God, it says, in the order of his course, According to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. Let me explain what that is really saying. First off, he's a son of Aaron. He is a priest. And he was according to the course of Abijah. Now, we're going to look at that in just a minute. But I want to next talk about the lottery. Did you know they had the lottery back then, believe it or not? But it was a different kind of lottery. There were, the priests were active from the age of 30 to 50, okay? So they were active for like 20 years. When you think about the morning and evening offering twice a day, okay, <clears throat> you take 365 days in the year, basically 730 times a year, they would do a morning and evening sacrifice, right? Right? 730 times in one year. Well, guess what? They had over 10,000 priests at that time. How many of you want to sit on the bench or be in the game? A lot of these priests are sitting on the bench. You got 10,000 priests and it's only 700 times in a year. That means over the 20 year time period, twice a day, 
It was 14,600 times. There's only 10,000 priests. Okay, that means some of the priests in their entire life will never get to offer the incense. They had a lot, so they broke the, everything, every step during the priestly service was broken into little things and you might win the lottery for something else if not the big one. Everyone wants to do the incense because that's right next to the Holy of Holies. Wow, not only that, how many of you, when you go to the Western Wall, you put a little prayer in there, right? Every priest wants to be to the incense because they get to talk to God real close and pray, God, help me. I need this or I need that. So every priest wants to be the one to be the close to God as they can so he'll hear their prayer. <clears throat> so what they did, they had a lottery. Okay, we're going to have a lottery of who gets to clear the ashes. Oh, hope it's me, you know. And then, okay, now we get to pick who gets to slaughter the lambs. Who gets to splash the blood. Who gets to clean the incense altar? Who gets to light the menorah? Who gets to burn the incense? So what they did, they said you can only burn the incense once in your life. Once you did it, you never could again. We know Zacharias was old. This was probably his last year to do it, and he's never been able to offer the incense. Now, how many of us so often been praying to God for something, and he doesn't answer, and he doesn't answer, we think he forgot us when actually... He's waiting for the perfect time for you to do it. So here his whole life is about over as a priest and he's praying and he wins the lottery that time to burn the incense. And so look at 1 Chronicles 24, 1 and 2. It says, now these are the divisions of the sons of Aaron, the sons of Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, Eliezer, and Itamar. But we know Nadab and Abihu died on the inauguration ceremony of the tabernacle. And uh, it says uh, they had no children. Therefore, Eliezer and Itamar executed the priest's office. Okay? And notice that's exactly what it said in Luke 1.8. In Luke 1.8, he's the one who executed the priest's office. And down here in Chronicles, they're the one who executed the priest's office. And then it also said they did it according to the customs. Well, look at uh, 1 Chronicles 24.10. The eighth course went to Abijah. Well, we just read Zechariah was from the course of Abijah. And he was the eighth course. And then look at 1 Chronicles 24, 19. It says, these were the orderings of them in their service to come to the house of the Lord according to their customs under Aaron, their father, as the Lord God of Israel had commanded him. Okay, so what they did, they divided all of Aaron's uh, sons into 24 courses. That's what David did, 24 courses. And they each served one week twice a year. And 24 times two is 48 of the 50 some weeks, all right? But three weeks, because Josephus, who lived back then, said there were two and a half million Jews in Jerusalem for the feast. Two and a half million! Okay, so when everyone's coming and they all want to do sacrifices, they would divide uh, into three groups, eight divisions, eight divisions, eight divisions, and every priest had to serve during the feast. Okay, and one group would slaughter the animals, and another group would be doing something else, another group would be doing something else. But with that said, huh, let's take a look at this. Nisan 1 is the beginning of the religious year. So the first course would serve the first week of Nisan. The second course served the second week. But guess what? Here's Passover. So Passover, that entire week, all 24 courses serve, okay? So he not... Uh, and so here, this is the... The third course, even though it's the fourth week, it's the third course because everyone. So the people that worked here that were the third course had to work two weeks in a row. They had to serve with everybody. Then they had their own course. And then, so that's the uh, third course. And then the following week, what do we have? The fourth course, the fifth course, the sixth course, the seventh course. What comes next? And you're good. The eighth course. So here is Zacharias serving the eighth course, but he can't go home yet because now we have Shavuot. 
So he has to work two weeks, his main course, and now everybody's there. And I think it's so fascinating. God waits for all two million people to be there for him to give them the vision. He doesn't, he makes sure clear back thousand years ago that he would have the eighth course, that it would be at Pentecost when this thing happens. So everyone would know it's happening. And so uh, let's look at this now. It says in Luke 1, 10 through 12, it says, and the whole multitude of the people. Now, I think the Greek word is plethora. Well, you know, we get to, I mean, it was thousands and thousands and thousands of people were praying without at the time of incense. The time of incense, nine in the morning, three in the afternoon. And you know this is Shabbat, oh, because there's a multitude of people there. Plus, it shows you when it's the eighth course. And then it says, there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side. The right side. Is that north, south, east, or west? Let's just think for a minute. The temple faces which direction? East. Okay. So if you're, uh, which way is east here? Let's see. That way is east, right? Okay. So the temple is facing this way, Right. And so back here is going to, uh, over here is the menorah. The altar of incense is right here. Okay, so you have the temple facing east and the right side uh, would be south, north. I hear both. It's north. It's always north. Okay, because if I'm facing west, it's north. You following me? It depends on which way you're looking. But anyway, but yes, if you're looking at the altar of incense, my right side is north, okay? Now, uh, let's see where I'm at. Okay, Luke 1, 13 through 15. And the angel says to him, chill, Zacharias, because your prayer is heard. What was he praying for? A kid. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear a son, and you shall call his name. Now, it's not John. It's Yochanan. And Yochanan means God is gracious. That's what he called him. God is gracious. Wow. And he says, uh, you'll have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at your son's birth. He will be great in the sight of the Lord. And that says, he will drink neither wine nor strong drink. He'll be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. What does that mean when he says he won't eat or drink, I mean, wine or strong drink? He's a Nazarite. It's a Nazarite vow. He can't cut his hair. Okay, so this, he's like Samson. All right, this kind of a deal. Well, look at Judges 13, three through five. The angel of the Lord appears to the woman and says to her, behold, you are barren. And that's what Elizabeth was. And bear not, but you will conceive and bear a son. Now, therefore, beware, I pray you, and drink not wine or strong drink, and don't eat any unclean thing, for you will conceive a son. Uh, and so, who was that? Samson. That was Samson. Okay, so now let's go to Luke chapter 1, verse 17. It says concerning Yochanan or John, he will go before the Messiah in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. Where does that come from? Malachi. Okay. And uh, it says, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. All right. Now, don't you think Zacharias and Elizabeth told John as he got older, when he's like 13 years old, hey, you're special, Right. You're going to go in the power of Elijah, right? So what is a teenager going to think? I'm going to go in the power of Elijah. You know what? I bet you I'm going to go up in a chariot of fire, just like Elijah. That's what he thinks. But now he's in prison. Hey, are you the guy or not? Am I going to go up in a chariot of fire or get my head chopped off? You know, uh, expectations. But in Luke 1.18, the next verse, Zechariah says to the angel, well, how am I going to know this? I am old and my wife is old. I think it's interesting that Abraham basically says the same thing in Genesis 15, 8. And he said, Lord, how am I going to know that I'm going to inherit this land? But uh, God didn't make Abraham not speak for a while. (laughs) You know, I think it's just kind of interesting. He had the same question. 
uh, concerning him and Sarah. But now look, in Luke 1, 19 and 20, the angel said, look, I'm Gabriel. I'm the one who stands in the presence of God. You know what? I, I, this just now hit me. The presence of God is in the Holy of Holies. Gabriel probably just, man, he's probably always there in the holy place and they don't even realize it, but he manifests himself while he's there. And he says, I am sent to speak to you and to show you <clears throat> some good news. And behold, you will not be able to speak until the day that these things are performed because you did not believe my words, which shall be fulfilled when? What does that mean? When it says you'll be it'll be fulfilled in its season. The word season means moed, an appointed time. So that means John the Baptist is going to be born on a feast day. You following me? He's going to be born on a feast day at an appointed time. <clears throat> Just like Isaac when he was born at an appointed time. And what day was Isaac born? Passover. Exactly. And here John is born on Passover. And every Passover, they put a cup for Elijah because who's supposed to come on Passover? Elijah. And he's in the power and spirit of Elijah and he's born on Passover. Okay. Now, how long was Zechariah speechless? How long was he speechless? Nine months. <laughs> okay. Now, it was from Shavuot when God appeared to him, clear till Passover the following year. He conceived about three weeks after he went home. Okay? So here we see he had to serve his eighth course. Then he served the whole week of Pentecost. And then he comes home and says to his wife, we need to get busy. So look what happens in Luke 1. 21 and 22, Zechariah at the time is in the holy place and everyone was waiting for him and they marveled that it took so long. And when he came out, he couldn't speak to them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple for he beckoned unto them and remained speechless. <clears throat> what were they waiting for him to come out and do? Say the priestly blessing from number six. How do you say the priestly blessing if you can't talk? And so everyone knew something was going on. And then look at Luke 1, 26 and 27. It was in the sixth month, that same angel Gabriel, who was sent from God, went to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David and the virgin's name was Mary. Okay. Let's do some math. I love math. It was the sixth month, right? Well, you can go from June to six months. You end up in December. It was the end of June, July, August, September, October, November, December, six months. It was at the end of December that Gabriel appears to Mary or Miriam. All right. And guess what? This is Hanukkah. This is when Noah's flood waters ended and the rainbow comes. This is when Messiah is conceived, becoming the light of the world during the festival of lights of Hanukkah. All right, so what do we see? Here, here's Hanukkah right from here to here. And here the angel appears to Miriam and says, you're going to be pregnant. Now, this is the end of December. The end of December. And how long is a woman pregnant? Nine months. That will put Messiah being born in September at the Feast of Tabernacles. You can prove biblically when he was born. It wasn't at Christmas. It was during the Feast of Tabernacles when God tabernacles with men. He literally tabernacled with men at that very same time. Okay. And Joseph... Uh, I mean, Zechariah conceived John on Passover. Because if you remember, uh, oh, and I added some verses to your notes here just a little bit. Sorry. Uh, <clears throat> but what do we see here? 
In Luke 1 30, it goes on to say, the angel said to her, don't fear for you found favor with God and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and you shall call his name Yeshua. How many of you know they didn't speak English 2000 years ago in the Middle East? Okay. And it says, he shall be great and he shall be called the son of the highest and the Lord God will give unto him the throne of his father, David. When it says his father, David, we know supposedly Joseph was his father, but we also know he wasn't his father. But when he says the father, David, he's saying, this is the Messiah. That's what he's saying. And he'll reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom, there will be no end. So what's interesting is you can see he's talking about the Messiah because in Isaiah 9, 6 through 11, a child is born, a son is given, the government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace will be no end. Here it is, upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it, establish it with judgment, justice from henceforth forever and the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Now, <clears throat> what's interesting, kings are all anointed. Prophets are anointed. Priests are anointed. And Messiah was all of that. He was a king. He was a priest. He was a prophet. And the Holy Spirit is what is represented by the anointing. And the Holy Spirit anoints him when he comes down as he's being immersed, as well as when he was born. And now look at Luke 136. Behold your cousin Elizabeth. She's also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her. Okay. Now, look at Luke 156. Mary stayed with her three months and then returned to her house. Why do you think she stayed with her three months? What's six plus three? Nine. <laughs> Waiting for her to have the baby. Okay. And so uh, you also see if it's the end of December and she stayed three months, that puts you right into the end of March, which is when Passover is. So you can also see when he was born. Now, <clears throat> what do we see here concerning John the Immerser, Luke 1, 59 through 64, it came to pass on the which day? Eight day, and how long is Passover? Eight days. He literally is circumcised on the last day of Passover. This is huge. The last day of Passover is also the very day that the uh, Israelites crossed the Red Sea. That's the, time, that's the very same day, total freedom. And so it says on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, but most people don't know that's the last day of Passover. <clears throat> and they were going to call him by the name of his father and Zacharias and his mother said, no way. He's going to be called John. And they said to her, there isn't anyone among your family called by that name. And they were making signs to his father what he would wish him to be called. And having asked for a tablet, he wrote down, his name is going to be Yochanan. And they all wondered. And all of a sudden his mouth was opened and his tongue and he was speaking, praising God. Wow. Now look at Luke 168. It says, blessed be the Lord God of Israel for he has visited and redeemed his people. He's raised up a horn of salvation. And it says that uh, for, in, uh, for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. Do you realize what it says since the world has began? That means the prophets were around from Adam's time. Okay, who was one of the prophets we know of in Genesis? How about Enoch? Okay. Uh, we also have, uh, let me see, who was the other one? Pardon me? But there, there was a couple of prophets back then. Okay, well, let's look at this. We talked about he's raising up a horn of salvation. Look at 2 Samuel 22, verse 2 and 3. He said, the Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer, the God of my rock and him I will trust. He is my shield and what? This is showing Yeshua is divine. Okay. High tower, my refuge and my what? Savior. What's his name? Yeshua. Okay. And you save me from what? What's the Hebrew word for violence? Hamas. Okay. And then in Luke 1, 76 to 79. And you, child, we called a prophet of the highest, for you're going to go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. Hmm. He's preparing for people who's going to see the face of the Lord. To give knowledge of Yeshua by the remission of their sins, 
through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high has visited us to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet in the way of peace. Okay, he's talking about people who are sitting in darkness and in the shadow of death. Who could that be referring to? Well, let's go to Psalm 107, 8 through 10. Then they cried to the Lord, that's the yud heh vav in their trouble. He delivered them out of their distress. He led them forth by the right way that they might go to a city of habitation. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he satisfies the longing soul. He fills the hungry soul with goodness, such as those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. So he's talking about the yud heh vav Matter of fact, look at Isaiah 9, 2. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death upon them hath light shined. And that light was Yeshua. Okay, I've added some verses here that aren't on your notes. So I just put, uh, just write the reference down. Because I want to show you something else that some of you are very familiar with. Some of you that are new, this is going to be a shock. Okay, look at this. In Luke 2 now. Oh no, I got... Uh, Luke 180, look at this. This is kind of fascinating. Referring to John the Baptist, the child grew, was strengthened in spirit, and he was in the deserts till the day of his showing to Israel. You know why? Mom and dad are dead. He's the only child. His parents, remember they were very old when he was born? So he's probably maybe 10 years old when his parents are dead. Both of them. He has no family really. But I just want you to realize too how, how this unfolded. Okay, well, let's look at Luke 2, 6 though. It says, and so it was while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. This is Yeshua, Miriam delivering Yeshua. And it says, she brought her forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in the manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Okay, why was there no room for them in the inn? He was born on the Feast of Tabernacles. There's two and a half million Jews there. Okay, there's no room in the hotels. Now, let me ask you this. How many of you would go to Alaska in December or January? How many would go to Hawaii in December or January? This is more proof that Jesus was not born in December because it snows in Jerusalem in December. You're, you're not going to have no room in an inn in December. Everybody's out of there, okay? This happened, he was born at the Feast of Tabernacles. And then, what does it mean by he was wrapped in swaddling clothes? You know what that means? This is mind-blowing. The priestly garments, the all-white priestly garments that have been thoroughly stained by the sacrifices and the blood of the sheep and the goats that were sacrifices for our sins, when they can't be worn anymore, they cut the linen uh, priestly clothing into strips. So they're strips, and they use those strips to light the wicks of the big candles in the women's court. But guess what? They also put a whole bunch of them in the women's court in baskets. And that's what the women take home. And wrapped in swaddling clothes means Jesus was wrapped in the swaddling clothes of the priestly garment stained by sin. That's what he was wrapped in. That is incredible. Okay, now look at Luke 2, 8. There were in the same country Shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. What do they pray for uh, in October over there in Israel, right after the feasts are done? What are they praying for? Rain, exactly, which is another reason why he couldn't have been born in December. Who? They don't keep the shepherds and the sheep out in the middle of winter. They put them in the sheep folds, okay? So there's no way he was born in December. He was born in the fall at the Feast of Tabernacles, and then they end up putting the sheep in the folds. Now, here's the next thing. I love this picture. It says in Luke 2, 21, when the eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Yeshua, which is the name the angel gave before he was conceived in the womb even. Okay, eight days. You're circumcised on the eighth day. 
Just like John with the eight days of Passover, she was born on the first day of Sukkot and the eighth day he's shedding his blood in the temple being circumcised, confirming the covenant to Abraham. I mean, this is, it's all tied to the festivals. Everything is. And then look at this in Luke 2, 22 through 24. Now he's born, he's circumcised, but Miriam or Mary has become unclean because she gave birth. There's nothing wrong with being unclean, by the way. But ritually, she's unclean. And it says, when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished. Okay, they're in Nazareth. Now they got to go bring them to Jerusalem to present them to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And then look what it says in Luke. Everything was done according to the law, it says. And then it says to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Did you know that's not what it says? Then you go, what? It says, it says that. Yes, but it's only half true. We got to look at the other half by going to what he was talking about. And if you go to Leviticus 12, six through eight, it tells us what the law says. When the days of her purifying are fulfilled for a son or for a daughter, she shall bring a what? A lamb is what she's supposed to bring of the first year for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation to the priest who will offer it before the Lord and make an atonement for her and she'll be cleansed from the issue of her blood. This is the law for her that is born a male or a female. We just got done reading. She did everything according to the law. Well, wait a minute. Look at the next verse. If she's not able to bring a lamb, she's so poor, then she can bring the two turtles, doves, or the two young pigeons, the one for the burnt offering, the other for a sin offering, and the priest will make atonement for her and she shall be clean. This tells us that the Magi had never come or they'd had all kinds of money, okay? And, but the other thing is this, being Miriam and Joseph and so blessed would be able to give birth to the Messiah, don't you think she wished she had a lamb? She did. Messiah is the lamb of God. She always had the lamb. Anyway, we'll stop with that. Let's stand.